Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm Dr. Kim Williams, and it's my pleasure this morning to introduce the introducer, as I normally do. Uh, our speaker will be Dr. Mark Burns, giving us a, a an update on monkeypox, which we'll all, we'll all need to know more about. But to, to introduce more about Dr. Burns, I'd like to introduce my uh, wonderful division chief uh, in infectious disease, Dr. Forrest Arnold. Uh, Dr. Arnold uh, was indeed a Tennessee volunteer until he went to um, the old school at West Virginia University. Uh, he did internships and residency between West Virginia and Tennessee and did his uh, infectious disease fellowship at um, Louisville. And like uh, many people who are clearly interested in um, in uh, academia, he joined the faculty and then expanded his uh, horizons by doing a master of science in clinical investigation uh, at University of Louisville. And that, uh, as it always does, uh, catapulted him into being even more prolific in terms of um, research and contracts and, and uh, publications. And he's been a wonderful educator as well. And um, is recently uh, promoted to full professor as well as division chief in infectious disease. And so congratulations on all of that, Dr. Arnold, and please introduce our speaker. Thank you very kindly. Um, it's my privilege today to introduce Dr. Mark Burns. He has been with the division. And so since then, he's realized that infectious diseases is an infectious and exciting specialty. And so more and more people, I hope, are coming our way. And if so, part of it would be because of him. I think people should uh, stay at Louisville or come to Louisville because of the work that Dr. Burns is doing. He's done a lot of his work here at U of L throughout his career and has uh, settled at this time at the VA where he sees inpatients. He goes to both of our clinics over there. He's the hospital epidemiologist, works with infection control and does antimicrobial stewardship. So his hands are full and um, now he's giving grand rounds on monkeypox and it's my privilege to introduce him one tidbit people might not know is that he has a special knack for board review questions. So that seems to be one of his strengths and we try to draw upon that as well. Um, Dr. Burns, uh, please, let's hear from you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Callie, for all the, uh, all the, all the words of encouragement and kindness. I appreciate that. Um, today, we're going to do an update on monkeypox. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen now. I'm going to hopefully be successful with this. Um, and, and let's see. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Very good. good. All right. Good deal. Okay. So, um, to go ahead and proceed, I have no disclosures. Uh, the uh, goal of, of today with, with regards to objectives, we're going to recognize the roots of transmission of monkeypox virus. We're gonna be aware of clinical manifestations of monkeypox virus. Uh, we're gonna be familiar with the specimen collection method. And finally, uh, hope to understand the use of antivirals and vaccines for monkeypox. This is the outline I'm gonna follow. Uh, we'll do introductions in history, follow epidemiology, physiology, transmission, clinical presentation, testing, treatment, and talk a little bit at the very end about vaccines. Now, monkeypox uh, is a disease caused by the monkeypox virus, which is an uh, enveloped double-stranded DNA virus that belongs to the orthopox virus genus of the poxiviridae family. It's spread through contact from an infected animal, infected person, or virus-contained objects and materials. Monkeypox has a similar presentation to smallpox uh, in humans. It starts with an initial febrile prodrome, followed by centrally distributed macropapular rash on the trunk with involvement of the limbs. There are also lesions that are often present on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. Now, monkeypox primarily occurs in the rainforest of West and Central Africa. And as a result, it has two recognized clades. The first is the West African clade, followed by the Congo Basin clade. Uh, the differences 
and their epidemiologic and clinical features between the viral isolates does support the distinction for the, uh, for the, for the two clades. Uh, it's been said that the uh, Congo Basin clade has been more transmissible and disease is more severe with that. With regards to tax, uh, taxonomic rank, as I mentioned before, uh, it's in the, uh, it's in the uh, uh, Poxaviridae family, uh, along with the, uh, with the genus of the uh, orthopox virus and the actual virus itself is in the, uh, it's included with variola virus. It's similar to variola virus, along with cowpox and vaccinia virus. Uh, this probably explains it a little bit better from the orthopox viruses, uh, there is monkeypox and it is similar to some of these other viruses uh, that, are, that are present. Now, as far as history goes, the, um, uh, the first case, uh, or should I say monkeypox was first discovered in 1958. Um, it, it was discovered in a, uh, in a uh, colony of monkeys that were being kept for research. They noticed that they had a pox-like disease. The first human case, however, did not arise until 1970 when it was discovered in a nine-month-old uh, child. Um, since then, uh, it's been primarily contained in, in West and Central Africa. It didn't arrive until the United States until about 2003. Um, at that time, in late two, in the spring 2003, they did note that there were persons identified in the Midwest that had developed uh, fever, rash, and respiratory symptoms along with lymphadenopathy. This was after being exposed to a uh, pet prairie dog that had been imported uh, from, the, from those areas. Uh, they found out that they were infected with the monkeypox virus at that time. Um, also in the United States, before 2022, uh, in July, there was a case uh, of a uh, traveler that had, gone, that had come from Nigeria uh, that uh, had been in Dallas, Texas. And in November of that same year, a second traveler was noted. So it was determined that monkeypox cases in people outside of Africa, they were linked to the international travel from Africa. Also, um, there, was, there were cases that you had imported animals or objects or products from high prevalence areas. Uh, May, on May 18th of this year, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health announced that it had a confirmed case of monkeypox in an adult male who recently visited Canada. Um, and on July 23rd uh, of this year, the WHO did declare monkeypox a public health emergency. Here in the US, the uh, Health and Human Services Department declared the uh, US outbreak a public health emergency. With regards to epidemiology, uh, here from the CDC as uh, late as November 7th, is a case count um, um, of monkeypox throughout the uh, throughout the U.S. And here is a case uh, by, or should I say, state by state cases uh, that that are present. Notice that in Kentucky, uh, we uh, at least as as late as November seventh had seventy four cases. Uh, our border states around us: uh, Illinois, Indiana, Missouri, Tennessee. Uh, and Ohio all had higher cases. The only exception uh, would be West Virginia, which had 12 cases uh, at that time. Now, with regards to epidemiology, among U.S. monkeypox cases, uh, according to the CDC, 99% of these cases occurred in men, 94% of which had reported recent male-to-male -male sexual uh, or close intimate contact. Now, most infections during the current outbreak have been transmitted through close intimate contact with symptomatic people, primarily during sexual contact. The majority of infections have been transmitted among men during male-to-male -male sexual contact. Heterosexual transmission, along with transmission to children through close non-sexual skin-to-skin contact with the caregiver, along with transmission through needle stick with the skin lesion contained, uh, excuse me, contaminated sharp, as well as through piercing and tattooing have also been reported. 
Now, with regards to the pathophysiology, the virus does enter uh, through the oropharynx, nasopharynx, or it can enter through intradermal roots. Once present, it replicates at the inoculation site and it spreads to regional lymph nodes. After which, uh, an initial viremia will also spread the virus to other body organs. Here's a, um, here's a slide that sort of summarizes uh, pretty much what happens. With, if you look at the top, human to human transmission, which can occur through um, respiratory droplets, contaminated surfaces, that is fomites, or through uh, contact through the mucal cutaneous lesions, the virus uh, can enter. And then after viral entry into those uh, ports that I mentioned, uh, it will circulate to lymph nodes um, uh, draining the mucosa. Also with animal to human transmission, uh, it can enter again by way of bites and scratches from infected animals through blood and body fluids of infected animals, and also through hunting and cooking and consuming of bush meat or contaminated meat. Again, it all leads to uh, uh, primary viremia, which then uh, spreads to lymphoid organs and other distant lymph nodes where a viral replication continues to occur. At which time we get what's called a secondary viremia. And at that point, from the secondary viremia, it can go to skin, it can also go to other tertiary organs. This is considered within the prodromal stage. And then you, and then once in those tertiary and skin, tertiary organs and skin, you can have the clinical manifestations of monkeypox. And you'll note, and I will reemphasize this during the talk, the incubation stage, which overall is about anywhere from seven to 21 days. Now, pox viruses themselves produce two types of infectious particles. They have what's called envelope virions, and they also have what's called mature virions. Now, both viral particles have different vir uh, viral surface epitopes and are enveloped by a lipoprotein outer membrane. The monkeypox virus itself, uh, morphologically, is an oval or brick-shaped virion particle. And this is an illustration of what actually happens uh, when we get infected um, uh, with regards to the monkeypox virus. Now, um, the monkeypox virus, uh, whether it's the envelope virion or the mature virion, it, uh, it will uh, find its way into the cell either by micropenocytosis uh, for the, uh, for the, oops, sorry, uh, uh, either micropenocytosis or by fusion. Um, the virus itself does utilize our, our host ribosomes, that is for the host cell. Um, and you, it utilizes it for the mRNA translation. Otherwise, however, uh, the virus itself has all the necessary enzymes and proteases for replication, transcription, and assembly in their own genome. So once it enters the cell and becomes uncoated, uh, early transcription does occur, producing early proteins. Now these early proteins uh, do produce growth factors and immune defense modulators. In addition, it produces other intermediate transcription factors and DNA RNA polymerases. Uh, these uh, latter uh, items do aid in, in uh, further DNA replication, at which time intermediate proteins and late proteins are formed. Uh, eventually, the new virions uh, become formed, and some uh, will, will form into the envelope virions and others into the mature virions. Mature virions do get released by lysis, and the envelope virions are released by exocytosis. As we will learn further when we talk about treatments, uh, our treatments affect different portions uh, of this life cycle uh, to, to prevent uh, uh, further infection. Yeah. The, once again, the, the principal mode by which people have been infected have been, has been through close contact 
uh, that has occurred during sexual activity with people having one or more monkeypox lesions on the skin or their mucosal surfaces. Now, a small number of infections have occurred, however, from injury with a sharp instrument used during skin sampling lesions, as well as through skin piercing and tattooing. Now, transmission can also occur, as I alluded to earlier, from animal to human uh, through scratches, bites, and it can also be um, uh, it can also be transmitted through uh, the bushmeat preparation, whether direct or indirect contact with body fluids or lesionous material. With regards to human to human transmission, it can occur through respiratory droplets that is through sneezing and coughing. Uh, it can also occur during direct contact with the viral lesion and body fluids themselves. It can also occur with infected materials through clothing or infected linens, again, uh, uh, infected through fomites. Mother to child transmission has been documented and can occur through the placenta. This has actually been known as congenital monkeypox. Now, presently, it's not clear where the monkeypox virus can be transmitted through sexual roots. And further research uh, is going to be needed with well-controlled animal models to understand this. Now, with regards to clinical presentation, now, in general, with monkeypox, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, infection uh, is uh, uh, heralded with fever, chills, muscle aches, backache, fatigue, with progression to total exhaustion as reported by some patients. And again, the incubation period on average is seven to 14 days, but it can uh, last up to 21 days. So it actually can be anywhere from seven to 21 days. Now, during this particular outbreak, however, a rash in the anal genital oral pharyngeal or perioral lesions has been the predominant symptom of infection at the time of diagnosis, which according to the CDC has happened in up to about half of the patients reporting um, uh, re reporting symptoms of monkey of monkeypox. And again, they report rash as being their first symptom. With regards to the typical prodrome, such as the fevers, chills, and lymphadenopathy occurring afterwards. But again, the important thing is during this current outbreak, the rash has been the first symptom. So from information uh, received by the CDC, again, rash uh, has been reported in all the, uh, the cohorts that they have, they, that they have reviewed. Uh, fever has been in 63% of those people, along with chills and lymphadenopathy coming in at about 59%. Now, with regards to the rash, the rash has been most frequently reported 46% of the time on genitals. 40% have appeared on the arms, 38% with the face, and 37% on their legs. Legs, lymphadenopathy, back pain, and myalgias, along with lymphadenopathy, which has been a distinctive feature of monkeypox that differs it from things like smallpox and measles. But again, in this current outbreak, since May of 2022, up to half the patients have reported rash as their first symptom. Now, in general, the skin eruption occurs, that usually occurs begins on the face and the extremities. Um, that is the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. Also, there are oral muco uh, mucous membranes that are involved. Genitalia can also be involved along with conjunctiva and the cornea. Now, with regards to the rash, the rash evolves sequentially. It starts out with macules, that is, lesions with a flat base, and progresses to papules, uh, raised firm lesions, and eventually they become vesicles, that is, lesions, these lesions become uh, fluid filled with clear fluid. Eventually they evolve to pustules, that is the lesions will be filled with either yellowish or whitish type fluid. And finally, uh, the lesion, lesions will crust up and dry up and fall off. Now, 
once they once these crusted lesions fall off and we get generation of new skin underneath where the crust were at that time persons the, the patients are considered non-infectious but before then even with the crust being present they still can be infectious again i want to reemphasize: not until the crust fall off and then you have generation of new skin underneath that that they are non-infectious so stage one occurs one to two days after uh, 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 after infection. Stage two, the papules, as I mentioned before, the um, uh, they last for about one to two days, followed by the third stage, the vesicles, which become bigger, larger, but they're clearly they're they're filled with clear fluid. After about a week or so, pustules. Uh, develop, that is these fluids fill with the yellow or whitish fluid again. Uh, and then finally, um, after uh, about two weeks, uh, they become crusted, scab, and eventually they will fall off. And here's just sort of a summary slide of showing all those stages once again. Now, with regards to clinical presentation during this current outbreak, the lesions often occur in the genital and anorectal areas. They can also occur in the mouth as well. Now, the rash is not always disseminated uh, across many of the body sites as it is when you have a typical presentation. Now, the rash can be confined to only a few lesions and in some cases, it's been reported as only a single lesion. And once again, um, during this current outbreak, the rash does not always appear on the palms of the soles. Now, during this current outbreak, it has been reported uh, some people have had purulent or bloody stools, rectal pain or rectal bleeding. They've also reported painful lesions and these lesions remain painful until the healing phase, that is when they become crusted and almost ready to fall off, at which time they become more itchy than anything else. Um, the fever and other prodromal symptoms that I mentioned before, it can occur before the rash, but again, uh, during this present outbreak, uh, most, most of them have been occurring after the rash. And in a few cases, according to the CDC, um, some of these prodromal symptoms have not been present at all. Respiratory symptoms, that is sore throat and cough and nasal congestion can also occur during this time. Now, currently people younger than 40 years of age may be more susceptible, susceptible to monkeypox. And the reason for this is because of the cessation of the smallpox vaccination campaigns from the 1980s. As you'll recall, in the 1980s, smallpox was declared eradicated. And as a result, vaccination against smallpox uh, uh, ceased. Complications of monkeypox that, that, that can occur include bronchopneumonia, sepsis, even, even encephalitis. Also, it's been reported infection with the cornea and ensuing loss of vision in some cases. Now, once again, um, in general, uh, this is usually a self-limited disease with illnesses typically, typically lasting anywhere from two to four weeks. Right now, the extent to which an asymptomatic infection can occur is unknown. The severity of illness can depend, however, upon the initial health of the individual as root of, of, of exposure. Uh, as, and as with most um, infectious type diseases, children and the elderly and those who have immune deficiencies uh, usually have worse outcomes. Now worldwide, out of more than 57,000 people that have uh, been infected with monkeypox, at least 22 have died. On September 13th of this year, the first death 
to monkeypox in the U.S. was confirmed in the person who lived in Los Angeles County, California. And today there have been a total of 10 patients who have died in the U.S. since uh, uh, as of November 7th of this year. Now diagnosis, who should get tested? Well, anyone who thinks they may have monkeypox or have had close personal contact with someone who has monkeypox. Now, demonstration of the presence of monkeypox virus DNA by polymerase chain reaction testing or PCR testing, either that or use of next, uh, next generation sequencing from a clinical specimen. Or, uh, of course, something that's a little more tedious would be monkeypox virus in a culture from a specimen. Now, detection of monkeypox by PCR using swabs of the skin lesions is the recommended method uh, to confirm infection in symptomatic people. And the reason for this is that skin lesions do contain the highest concentration of virus and are most likely to yield positive results. This was a, um, uh, this was a study done uh, uh, out of the Lancet, and it shows uh, actually uh, from cycle threshold values or CT values. And we know this uh, from, from COVID, that CT values, uh, cycle threshold values are inversely proportional to viral loads. So with that in mind, uh, you'll notice that uh, when you look at the skin, it has the lowest CT value. So being inversely proportional, it has the highest viral load. And then it, it goes uh, uh, in descending order from the skin to the anus, the throat, and blood, that urine and semen. But again, this is the, the point is to reemphasize re that the skin would have the highest amount of virus present. Uh, now, I got this slide from LabCorp site, and um, the main thing I just want to concentrate on, if you look at the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, I want to concentrate on number three. And the reason that's important, uh, we talk about sample collection and utilizing um, uh, the, uh, the media. When you're actually collecting, uh, you want to vigorously scrub or swap around the base of the lesion, being careful not to unroof the lesion itself. And as you'll recall, as I mentioned before, when we talk about transmission, uh, there have been some people that have been infected because they have been exposed to the fluid. Uh, from from these uh, uh, from these pustules and uh, vesicles, so again, it's important to scrub around the base and not to unroof the lesion. That will decrease the opportunity for any type of uh, uh, any type of infection or nosocomial type infection. Now, epidemiological evidence at present is insufficient, however, to establish exposure of other potential sources of infection, despite monkeypox virus DNA being detected. And in some cases, but not all, replication competent virus has been isolated from them. Now the risk of infection through contact with contaminated surfaces and objects, that is the fomites, is considered low. The monkeypox virus has been detected in the anal genital and, ure and urethral samples from asymptomatic, asymptomatic persons, that is people who don't have rash, lesions, or the signs of symptoms of illness. However, in these asymptomatic persons, no cases of transmission have, have yet been definitively linked to, being, to them being exposed or people being exposed to them. So they, they have not been linked to exposure to infected persons who are not showing signs of symptoms of illness, that is the asymptomatic people. Now, to further, uh, uh, to further hammer home that point, okay, uh, this slide is from the CDC itself, where monkeypox virus in human samples, and we talk about implications for transmission. Now, you'll notice that uh, we looked at the exposure source, and then we looked at whether monkeypox virus was detected by PCR and whether, whether there was replication competent virus present, 
And does this evidence actually support it being a source of infection? As I mentioned previously, if you look at the skin particularly, along with the oropharynx and the anorectal regions, yes, monkeypox virus has been detected. There's replication, vir repl replication competent virus present, and these have been sources of infection. However, when you look at other areas such as semen, urine, urethra, or in the conjunctival uh, fluid, monkeypox virus has been detected and there is replication virus present. However, at this time, there's insufficient data to support the fact that these can be sources of infection. And as you go down the list, looking through, um, even with uh, vaginal fluid, there's insufficient data to see if there's virus that is detected, if it's replication virus, virus present, or if it, if, it, if it can even be spread by this means. Of note, contaminated sharps has been supported as a source of infection. Now, presently, as I mentioned before, no infections have been reported from exposures to persons with monkeypox whose skin and mucosal lesions have fully healed. And one last thing with regards to diagnosis, if a person is diagnosed, this is the form that we use in Kentucky, uh, the reportable disease form, and it can just be filled out and it's very self-explanatory. And I just wanna mention, as we do this work up for monkeypox, uh, this article from the, article from the MMWR uh, did indicate that uh, when they put it out on September, in this past September, uh, about 2,000 people uh, with monkeypox infection in the uh, in eight in in eight year uh, I'm sorry eight uh, United States jurisdictions, 38 percent of those people had HIV and 41 percent had a sexually transmitted infection the preceding year. So the whole purpose, the bottom line for this is to remember, as you're screening for monkeypox, you should also screen for HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. Now, what about treatment? Well, with regards to treatment, for people with intact immune systems, supportive care and pain control is usually enough. You should consider treatment for people who have these clinical manifestations, those that have severe disease, those that may have a hemorrhagic disease, those that may have large number of lesions that are confluent, also those that may have present necrotic lesions. People with severe lymphadenopathy that can be uh, necrotinizing or obstructing, say that, that is, for example, obstructing in the airways, should be considered for treatment. People who have multiple organ systems involved should also be con considered for treatment, uh, in addition to those people who require hospitalization for monkeypox. Also, people to, to be considered for treatment, those that have involvement of anatomical areas that may cause serious sequelae. For example, uh, people that may have dysphagia as a result of swollen lymph nodes uh, in the cervical region. People uh, uh, that have, let's say, in their penile foreskin, the vulva, vagina, urethra, or anorectal areas, they can have a potential for uh, uh, stricture uh, formation or those that may require catheterization to maintain patent areas. Also, people with anorectal lesions that interfere with their bowel movements and people who have severe infections that may require surgical debridement. All these people need, need to be considered for treatment. Also, people who have, who have immune compromised diseases such as HIV, leukemia, those that may be uh, receiving radiation, those on TNF uh, inhibitors, or people on high dose corticosteroids, they should also be considered for treatment. Now, certain populations who are at risk for severe, for, for severe disease need to be considered for treatment as well. 
which includes pediatric patients, particularly those younger than age, uh, age eight. In addition, pregnant and breastfeeding people should be considered for treatment. People that have any condition that affects their skin integrity should be considered for treatment. And those that have extensive involvement from their from skin uh, uh, from from skin conditions should be considered for treatment as well. Now, currently, there's no treatment that has been approved specifically for monkeypox virus infections. U.S. government has stockpiled antivirals that have been developed and used for smallpox, and may be beneficial against monkeypox. Now, one of those antivirals is ticoviramat. Uh, ticoviramat is an inhibitor of cytochrome P2C8 along with cytochrome P2C19. Now, presently, uh, data is not available on the effectiveness of ticoviramat in treating monkeypox. However, uh, ticoviramat has been shown to be effective in treating disease caused by orthopox viruses. Ticoviramat can be considered, however, for use, uh, for prophylactic use, a person exposed with a, uh, that is a person with a severe immune deficiency in the T cell function uh, for which smallpox, monkey, monkeypox vaccination uh, has been contraindicated. In addition, cytophavir or the prodrug Bren cytophavir can be used. It's been shown to be effective against orthopox viruses in in vitro and animal studies. One thing to remember, however, rincipavir should not be used simultaneously with cytopavir. Vaccine immune globulin, which has not been approved for the treatment of monkeypox. However, the CDC does hold an expanded access uh, IND protocol for it. Presently, it's unknown whether a person with severe monkeypox would benefit from its treatment. And, but it can be considered for prophylactic use in people with severe T cell uh, dysfunction. And finally, what about vaccines? Well, the two vaccines that uh, are more likely to be, to be used, particularly here in the US, Genios will, would, would be used. Uh, ACAM 2000, uh, not so much, but it might be available in some places. But they, uh, but these vaccines are used for, for the prevention of monkeypox. First, with regards to Genios, uh, it's used for people older than the age of 18, and it's under an emergency use authorization that was issued back on August 9th of this year. Okay, Genios is a live attenuated non-replicating orthopox virus and is given in a series of two doses administered 28 days apart. Okay, it can be given either subcutaneously or intradermally and peak immunity is expected to be reached after approximately 14 days after the second dose. The duration of immunity, however, after one or two doses is currently unknown. and about ACAM 2000. Now, it's a live attenuated uh, non-replicating orthopox virus. Uh, uh, it used, you know, uh, I'm sorry, it's used uh, for the, uh, it is a, it is a, uh, a, a, a live attenuated non-replicating orthopox virus, but it's given through a bifurcated needle. Uh, and usually the skin is pricked about 15 times or so. Uh, and the way to determine if uh, the vaccine takes, so to speak, is by looking at the lesion afterwards um, and, and to actually see the site. And it's usually done about six days afterwards. And it, it, it should actually show where you, where you actually have what looks like a spiral where the, uh, where the needle has gone in. Again, that's considered a successful take from the virus. Now, ACAM 2000 has to be used with caution because it can cause myocarditis and pericarditis. 
Uh, in several studies, it's been shown that uh, on average, about one out of 175 people who got the vaccine for their first time did experience either myocarditis and or pericarditis. Now, with regards to how these work, as I mentioned before, uh, with the tipovirumab, it does affect uh, the actual virus itself. It prevents the release of the virus into the circulation. That is, it keeps it confined within the cytoplasm itself. Grin cytophavir along with cytophavir, cytophavir uh, do work during uh, the DNA replication. And, and what it does, it helps to stop the DNA replication. Bit of good news at this point, um, the daily monkeypox cases have declined significantly. Um, the peak, as you can see, was, was this past summer in August, but fortunately it has declined somewhat. So based on this, um, we are making headway. And uh, uh, right now I would just recommend that people continue being vigilant with observation and consider monkeypox in a differential when you talk about someone who may have been exposed, but uh, the presence of a rash or anybody that wants to be tested for it who is at high risk. I believe I'm going to stop here now and will entertain any questions that uh, anyone might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Burns, for an outstanding presentation. I know very timely. Um, I don't know if Dr. Williams or Dr. Um, Dr. Arnold would uh, have anything they would like to start off with. I do, but I'll let Dr. Williams go first. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say thank you. It's a, it's a you know fascinating uh, development of cross species infection that we're seeing so much of and. You know, the question, of course, is what is it that we should be doing to stop this from happening? I know that's more of a 35,000 foot question, um, but it's so important. Um, a lot of people, you know, I'm not sure that we could talk. You you, you mentioned, you know, the origin seemed to be in uh, Nigeria. Um, was there anything that we could have done? You know, the, the Southeast Asia live markets, that was an, an early target uh, for Anthea and Fauci. They have to stop. That's where that's what happened with COVID-19. Uh, but how about monkeypox? Was there something that we could have done to stop the this one and particularly learn from it and and stop the next one? Well, that's a that's a very, very, very interesting question. Um, to my knowledge, uh, I don't uh, I, I, I don't think there's anything that specifically that can be done other than if you some way to limit international travel, which is not gonna happen. Um, infectious diseases in and of themselves are, uh, can be somewhat geographical. Uh, when you start seeing uh, certain diseases in areas where they're not traditionally known, uh, it's usually due to either international travel or the import of items from an, from an endemic area. So it's really difficult to, to, to say if anything really could have been done. Uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to stop this outbreak. Again, remember, uh, it first entered the U.S. in 2003. So te technically, it's potentially been here since that time. Thanks. Um, having been here in 2003 in ID, I can tell you I'm much more familiar with monkeypox this go round because it's so much more common. And um, I had two questions, short ones. And the last slide you showed showed how quickly it came on and then how quickly it has nearly left. Um, in a span of four months, it peaked to over 500 cases a week. But in the middle of June to the middle of October, both those weeks at the beginning and end were less than 25 cases in the entire United States. So do you know why it was so fast? And my second question is, do you think we're gonna have a recurrence? Well, uh, to answer your first question, um, I think it was so fast because, um, because um, it's possible the diagnosis could have been missed. Um, uh, um, and, and people at that time, at least initially, I don't think were really that familiar with it. I think once uh, we became familiar with it, 
once the world, both, both the World Health Organization and the CDC announced, and if you recall, it was during the past summer that that they that they deemed this a public health emergency. I believe they got uh, a lot of providers' attention, and they did consider that within the differential. In addition, uh, they still had the stockpiles of the tegaviramab, particularly, but also uh, more 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 so the genios, and they had set up uh, vaccine. Uh, uh, vaccines uh, to be distributed, primarily to, to the to the people at risk, and uh, this demographic, according to this current outbreak, where uh, the men uh, the men who had sex with men, and uh, men who identified as gay uh, and uh, bisexual, uh, they use that as 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 the target organ organ uh, as as the target group. Uh, those people got vac a lot a large portion of those people got vaccinated. I believe that uh, is also partially responsible for the decline, in addition to just being knowledgeable on what to look for and, and just even to even think about it in the differential. Okay, there's some questions online. I, I think I'll let you navigate those, Jason. All right, uh, one question, uh, it's in the chat area, wants to know, is it possible to measure specific IgG and serum to find out if the vaccine was effective? Hmm. Uh, I'm not really familiar with that. Um, uh, if that can specifically be done, um, uh, I haven't seen any reports uh, that I can think of off the top of my head uh, where they've actually done that. I, I mean, I would imagine it, it, it could be. Uh, and again, if you're talking to IgG, I'm talking about pre, at least previous, previous exposure. Um, I think if it's present, within the current demographic that I just mentioned, then um, um, uh, number one, it shows that they've been affected. But now as far as effectiveness of the vaccine, um, that might be a little difficult in my opinion to, 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 to be able to answer. All right, and another, uh, another question, and I know it's, may have been, it's probably been mentioned already, but just to kind of follow up, uh, who is a candidate for vaccination? Again, those people at highest risk, the CDC determined if, uh, from their information, nine, remember 94% of the 99% of the people, of the men that were affected were identified as gay, bisexual, or uh, indicated that they were men that had sex with men. All right. Uh if uh, anyone has more questions, you can unmute and ask, or if you want, you can uh, type it in the chat area and we'll, uh, we'll read it there, read it from there. Hey, Jason. Yeah. This is uh, Dan Kemp in Division of Infectious Diseases. Uh, mm -hmm. Just want to put it out that I'm non-clinical, but um, did want to ask if Dr. Burns, you know, you said they are non, there's nothing FDA, I guess, indicated for um, monkeypox. So when you have somebody that presents and if you've seen it, what is your first, you know, when do you decide to use which um, of those, those items you listed that could be used to treat monkeypox? And when do you determine that you should use one of these? And then, um, and then how do you monitor the success of those um, those uh, antivirals that you're using. Okay. Well, uh, primarily, um, uh, it's it's going to be used with uh, with the people at risk. Okay, people who are at highest risk for that, which uh, again is that demographic that that, that I mentioned. Um, and also, it kind of depends on what's available. Okay. Uh, even though the, the U.S. has stockpiles, they have limited stockpiles. Uh, and so all these things may not be affected. Um, I want to re remind everyone, uh, you also have to think about the age of the person as well, too. Uh, those of us who are older, who got vaccinated against smallpox, we still have some degree of protection. Um, now, it, it's in, in the literature, I've seen anywhere from 60 to 85 percent effectiveness from our previous smallpox vaccinations, those of us who are old enough, you know, who've had that. The people I think born after, I would say 19, I'll just say 1980, just for argument's sake, um, when they started uh, to, or when they stopped giving these smallpox vaccines, those people are, are at highest risk. 
I would consider them. However, um, uh, also with, with, with regards to treatment, as I mentioned, those people that fall in those categories with comorbidities, um, those are the people that would be, would be considered for treatment. So I guess those people are considered for treatment and whatever you have available, um, whether it be the Genios or the, uh, or the, or the Ticoviramat, the Genios as far as vaccinations go, Ticoviramat or the Tpox uh, as far as treatments go. Uh, and, and basically uh, just routine follow-up uh, as far as monitor, how you would monitor the patient, uh, you basically just routine follow-up uh, and just, and just kind of see how they're doing. Um, the disease itself, again, should, uh, at, 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 at most part, uh, be manifest anywhere, at, uh, after anywhere from two to four weeks, a person should be over it. And especially if they're being treated, again, I, I would monitor them, monitor them during, during this period. Dr. Levinson, good to see you. Do you have a question? Oh, I wonder if I could uh, point something out. Uh, this is uh, Stanley Levinson and uh, uh, you know, we used to uh, talk a lot about opponents when I was in the lab at the VA. Yes, uh, anyhow, I just uh, I asked a question about the IgG, and I don't know that might be a study for someone. But anyhow, hello, there's a little freeze frame going on there. And I'm not quite sure it was as good as your talk, but it did give a lot of information. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. All right, uh, kind of guess last call here. We can still have a few minutes. If anyone has anything they'd like to ask, again, you can uh, put it in the chat area or if you want to unmute and ask, uh, that's um, please feel free. Or if Dr. Burns just covered it so well, there's not, there's just no, there's nothing to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> hey, uh, Dr. Burns, I have a quick question. This is Bilal uh, from ID. Um, do you hear me well first? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there a window of time after which the antiviral are not recommended in the course of the disease? Or it would be less efficient if we, if we started it maybe after a while, as we see in with some antiviral medications? Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure, Bilal, because even now, even with, with monkeypox, remember these, these, have, have, these medications have not been approved for monkeypox. They've just been effective against previous orthopox viruses. Um, so not, not that I'm aware of, not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Arnold or Dr. Williams, you guys, would you guys have a, anything you'd like to wrap up with here? <clears throat> no, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, just thanks for the update. And <clears throat> the most encouraging part to me was that slide with the with the downward curve. It looks like we're almost eight, eight, uh, uh, approaching zero, and uh, that would be really fantastic. Yes. All right. All right. If nothing else, Jason, we'll um, nothing I can let everybody go and uh, have a wonderful weekend. We're looking forward to uh, to next week, and we will. Um, Join Dr. Burns momentarily for the Cardinal Minute. All right. And thank you, Dr. Arnold. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Thank you guys, everybody, for helping facilitate, as, a, as mentioned, a timely and outstanding talk. And uh, next week, we'll have uh, Dr. Gab Ghazi from the cardiology division uh, presentation. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, we'll see everybody back here. Uh, be November 17th, next Thursday at 8 a.m. So we really appreciate it.